Mr. Steve Byrne joins us in the studio. Yes. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for coming in Thanks today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You're at Laugh Boston. You were there last night. You're there tonight, one show, tomorrow, two shows, two, right? Yeah. yeah. 745, 945, I think. Something like that, yeah. Something like that. that around sounds, that time. That sounds good, yeah. Uh, laughboston.com to get your tickets. And it's nice to have a fellow... Uh, Hoppa? Uh, a fellow Pittsburgher. Yeah. Yeah. Two half Asians from Pittsburgh Two, with who, radio voices. Right, exactly. Who who would have thought? You're listening to WAAF 107.3. There you go. Can you fill in for me for the rest of the show so I can <laughs> I, take I up I just early it, right? on Friday? Yeah. Here's the killers, Mr. Brightside. There you go. You're listening to WAAF. <laughs> I'm your host, Steve Byrne, Afternoon Drive. <laughs> yeah, it's uh so you grew you weren't born there, but you grew up in Pittsburgh, right? Is born correct? in Freehold. Uh, and grew up in Pittsburgh, yeah. Right. So I was in Freehold till like uh, Freehold Manalpin till I was like eight or nine, and then Pittsburgh Pirates. I don't know if you're a baseball guy. Garbage. Yeah, this year awful. Just get re- just why even bother? It's right. just so bad. It, it, it's just it's a business for them. They just get these draft picks and then they sell them off. And I know they, they make don't... the playoffs. They have an amazing season. It's like, well, eh, we'll dismantle this. We'll get rid of everybody. Yeah, we're not even just, gonna try. Not even try to pathetic. fill the seats. Yeah. And then the Steelers are falling apart and. That's why I've always been a hockey guy. I know. You are a serious hockey guy. You've played hockey. Josh Dolan uh, yep. is, a, is a serious hockey freak. Oh, nice. Do you play as well? Yes. Yeah. Also a black and gold fan, but different black and gold. Different, different black, black and gold. And gold. Yeah. <laughs> right. We yeah. had powder blue first, and then we upgraded <laughs> to the black and gold to keep it all in one. Yeah. How, how are they looking this year for you? I think, you know, the window is shrinking for the pens, and I think that they... It, look, it's hard to three-peat. So it's, it's you're asking a lot for a team to three-peat, but we repeated, and that was pretty mm-hmm. awesome. And we've made the playoffs ever since, uh, you know, it's been, I think it's like 12 years straight now. So there's nothing to complain about. Um, but, yeah, I, good luck to your, bro- to your Bruins. How do you feel about Phil Kessel leaving town? You know, you hear all these things about Kessel, and you guys have had the experience of having him over here, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he's just an eccentric guy. I think he's not going to go to the gym. He's going <laughs> to. He doesn't look like a professional athlete. No, he looks like <laughs> he looks like the guy. He's got the body of a cubicle worker. But he's a phenomenal athlete. So I think he's just this eccentric guy that plays by his own rules, and he produces. If he didn't produce, he wouldn't be in the league. But. He's fantastic. He's got an incredible shot. So I think any team's happy to have him. But, you know, eventually he it seems like he's one of those guys that wears out his welcome. Yeah. In terms of morale. You know, uh, you might know Steve Byrne from Sullivan and Son. Um, but you are also a director. And well, yeah. It, well, you directed. You're starting to do that, yeah. Yeah. And you directed a, a great, I have to say, it's a really great documentary on the amazing Jonathan. Thank you. Who we've had here in the studio. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a really sweet. Here we go. I know. I just want to, yeah. I got to ask you about this. <laughs> here we it, go. It's, it's, it, your documentary really focuses on him and uh, his manager. What is his name? His road manager. The, oh, the, Joel Osborne. The kid who, from Australia. Yeah. And, uh, and really, it's their story. Sure, and and um, it's a very sweet story in, of mutual admiration, and and but there's this other documentary out there. Yeah. Uh, it's just called the Amazing Jonathan documentary. Yeah, and when the Amazing Jonathan was last in our studios, it was that documentary crew. Uh-huh. Now, after watch, I watched your documentary. I had no idea there was a, another whole documentary crew. Sure. I thought that I was like I don't remember seeing Steve Byrne in here because I had no idea, and so it, his documentary is more of like it's it's weird, it's paranoid. You don't he's making it like you don't know what's real. Is yeah. jo- Jonathan really dying? But you're you're exactly right. He's making it like. So you know, are you saying it's not so much Jonathan? It's it's the director. Who's, it's certainly contrived for sure. And uh, you know when I found out I was in a film at Sundance, I was just like, why wasn't I invited? So that's kind of like it's nice to be on camera w- and given consent. So you know when I when I found out there was another film about Jonathan being made while I was making the film about Jonathan, I instantly thought it's the right thing to do to reach out to this other filmmaker and let's see what our narratives are. And if our narratives are different, then maybe we can still proceed forward. If if they're kind of the same, maybe we team up. I didn't know what the situation would be, but I thought the smart thing to do. And the respectful thing to do would be to reach out to this individual, whoever it is. So I did that. And then Jonathan, as you guys know, his three shows were, his first one, I think, was at the Wilbur. And then the other mm-hmm. one was like, or the Chinese restaurant, then the Wilbur, and then Foxwoods. And, or Mohegan Sun, sorry. So um, we, I called out, I, re- I reached out to him. We're talking. 
And I said, look, we should find out what our films are. And I said, I'll just go first. I'll just, you know, I'll just show you my cards and we'll see what happens. And then I told him, Jonathan's the face. Joel is the heart of the film. It's really about this great dynamic. And then his was more cinema verite, kind of fly on the wall, following Jonathan right. around. And more. It's usually kind of like more of an artistic vantage point of, of a film. So we agreed to proceed forward, you know, and... I show up here in town and I take a red eye over and you know at the luggage thing and Jonathan was on the same flight Joel was on the same flight and you know next thing I know it's like six in the morning there's a camera in my face and you know just asking questions I'm like hey you know I just got in can we not can you just not put me on on camera please you know not even like hey how you doing I'm I'm the other filmmaker just right. boom it's like a strong cup of coffee at 6 a.m. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> can we chill out and um and then that 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 stopped, and that's what ended up in that Hulu doc, you know. Right, your face is all blurred. You've all got blurred. the voice masking on, so you're like, oh, <laughs> get the camera on my face. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> you so sound like I, a... I sound demonic. Right, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and then we 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 agreed to meet in the lobby later that day. So we met in the lobby, and I said, look, I'm just here to cover the film, to, to cover the shows. I just want access to the shows, and I just want to interview him one of the three shows afterwards to see how he feels. That's all I need. He said, great, that's, that's great. And at the end of it, um, he basically said, uh, so can I interview you for my film? And I'm like, look, I don't want to be interviewed. I'm not putting myself in the dock. I hate docs that do that where the directors make themselves a part. I, I just don't want any... I don't want any notoriety. I'm just doing this to tell the story. He goes, well, don't you think you owe me? I was like, owe what? you? Oh, you what? I go, oh, you what? what do you mean? He goes, <laughs> he goes, well, I've been doing this two years longer than you, so don't you owe me? I go, look, man, I don't want to be in your film. I don't want to be in my film. So <laughs> don't put me on camera, okay? Please just do not film me. And he said, he said, okay. I said, don't film me, okay? And I held my hand out. He goes, I won't film you. We shook on it. And next thing I know, I get a call from two friends that are at Sundance. They're like, hey, you know, <laughs> did you know you're in the other doc? I go, no. They go, yeah, not only are you in the doc, you're the antagonist. And I'm like, what the? Yeah, he really and makes just, it like, it, it, and it's amazing because your documentary is so different from his. Yours is, I, I, I keep using the word sweet because that's what that story is, that friendship between Joel yeah. and Jonathan and, you know, them coming up together and him being like a father figure. And his was all like, is he really dying? He's smoking crystal meth. Yeah. You know, all this all this stuff. Uh, I would have, you know, and the reaction to the people, like Weird Al is in the other one and stuff. Sure. And their reaction was like, what the hell are you guys doing there? Yeah, and exactly. I, I, look, it was an uncomfortable situation for anybody to be in. And there's aspects where I pull myself out emotionally and go, well, what would I have done in the same situation? But... But I think that this other filmmaker just went to a very disrespectful route, especially once you shake hands and make an agreement. Right. Like, out of principle, I just find that uh, a tough pill to swallow. I just would never do that. And to know that the film was, you know, like celebrated and acknowledged like at Sundance, it's like, who would support a film where you're taking another filmmaker and throwing them under the bus narratively right. yeah. without without their consent and putting them in a film and you're going to okay that like I thought Sundance was a celebration of filmmaking and filmmakers with voices and they just went ahead and did it and and it just told me so much about the industry and it told me so much about this other person's character uh, I, I just I I just find it incredibly disrespectful and the fact that you know he showed up at our film premiere and filmed it and put yeah. us in that film and then he lied to us when he was there filming us like literally lying about being there i, I just thought why why can anybody not see through this and yeah. so i was glad when i saw the reviews come out in like variety and hollywood reporter and them just kind of like like they saw through the mist mm -hmm. they saw through the fog of war yeah. and they saw it for what it was and it was narcissistic and self-serving and he put himself in and he made it seem like i've got to film myself now Due to the circumstances, but prior to me showing up, he was always filming himself. So, oh yeah, he's you're, you're in your documentary. I, I do we even see you? I can't even remember seeing never. you. Never. You hear you only hear me once. It's at the very beginning of the yeah. film when I interviewed Copperfield. I just said describe Jonathan in one right. in one word. Yeah, and, and he's uh, in it throughout. He's like just he's up front, just like Jonathan is in his documentary. Yeah, yeah, I mean the great thing about our doc is that, and I've I've. Look, our film went up on YouTube. I talked to Bill Burr. I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys know who Bill oh, Burr yeah. is oh, yeah. in, <laughs> yes. in this town. So uh, so I talked to Bill and Al Magical, who run All Things Comedy. I just said, look, 
what I learned from this experience is that because the other doc, the other doc got to market place first because they were on Sundance and mm-hmm. they went to this film festival and so they were acquired there. And the thing I kept hearing from agents and buyers is that, well, their film has the value because they're first to market. So there's no real room for your film uh, on these other streaming platforms that would pay to acquire it. And I said, okay, okay. So I, I took a day or two and I said, well, the value is going to market first, right? I was like, well, what, everybody has Netflix and you know some people have Hulu, but everybody, everybody has access to YouTube. Right. So I was like, well, I'm going to go to market first. So I, I reached out to Burr and Al Magical and I said, I explained the situation. I said, hey, can we get this... Uh, can we get this film up? And they go, uh, they go, hell, <laughs> of course, different words, but right. hell yeah. So, <laughs> so we put it up, we launched it. I went on every podcast, Segura, Kreischer, everybody I knew that I could get in touch with that would have me at the time. And, you know, the films got almost 600,000 views in two and a half months. That's a lot for a documentary. It's not a five minute clip of, of but somebody's it's a, cat. You but know? it's a good documentary. I mean, it, it's a great story. Yeah, and, I think, and and Jonathan is such an a, a, a just incredibly interesting character, yeah, you know, on his own, and it's it's you know everything about it compared to the other documentary, you know the, the way it's filmed, the cinematography, the story, everything is great in it. The only problem with it is it doesn't have me in it like the other documentary does, and I think that's <laughs> maybe why you didn't get the respect at Sundance. I think so, yes, because there's at least nine seconds of me in the other documentary. Which well, believe probably, me, if I was going to put another half Asian in it, it would right? be you. It I, would not I be appreciate me. that. Yeah. I, you know, and I'll, if you want to do some reshoots, I'm I'm available immediately. I could recobble it together because yeah. it's on YouTube, and right. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, you know, the, that's the great thing about the film, though, is that we put it up. We were I, I said, let's leave the comment section as is. I never monetized it. I didn't want any adverts on it. I just said, I just want as many people to see this as possible. And it's got 19,000 likes to 200 dislikes. So that's a crazy, like, ratio of 19,000 yeah. to 200 yeah. some. And that's the thing I'm most proud of is that the people that have watched it, the people that have responded and communicated, even you go to the comment section, it's all like really positive i've seen like two, a handful of negative comments and one of them was <laughs> was just dumping on me like saying oh i can't believe asian kevin spacey made this and i was like that's asian like, kevin what? spacey <laughs> what the Which hell I'm is like, that i'm like all right oh that's that's fine if that's as bad as it gets in in terms of slag in the film that's that's okay but really proud of it and because of that film i got to make i'm making another doc for comedy central i haven't really announced it yet but i'll be doing that and and I, I, I kind of knew narrative because I wrote and directed a feature film called The Opening Act that's coming out sometime in 2020 about my early years in stand-up. And Jimmy O. Yang plays a younger version of me. Oh, nice. In that. Nice. From uh, Silicon. He's like Silicon Valley is probably yeah. the biggest thing people mean. No Not one Hot from, Dog. Yeah. Uh, Alex Moffat plays the feature act. And then Cedric the Entertainer plays the headliner. And the whole film is about a comic's first time ever on the road. Uh, it takes place over four days, and the first half of the film is like all the romanticism and optimism and partying of hanging out with the feature act that's played by Alex Moffat, and the back half of the film is the reality, sobriety, and isolation that comes with him warming up to this veteran that's played by Cedric the Entertainer. So so I got to kind of do those around the same time that Jonathan and this thing, and uh, yeah, I'm really proud of both of them, so I'm excited for them to come nice. out and getting back on the road and starting to do stand-up again i'm surprised you didn't uh just like lay out the other director of the other documentary because i i listened to your latest appearance on uh, the mm-hmm. fighter and the kid podcast oh. with brian callen <laughs> yeah, yeah and even like he had uh tariq do you remember his last name he's a trainer he trains like nfl players and stuff I forget like that. his last name but i, I he's, he's like a super nice guy he's like this afghani like trainer he's like ripped and he's like you've been in more fights than i've ever been in my lifetime then, yeah and he trains yeah, yeah and he and, and like he He's like fought with mercenaries. Like yeah. he went back to Afghanistan for a little while and yeah. got into a fight with a mercenary. Like or scary like fights. Yeah, yeah, scary fight. But you, it seems you are. It seems like you get into a lot of fights. I mean, no. I, look, back that's when obviously I was younger. The, is that the sure. Korean side of you? It's definitely the Korean. Yeah. It's definitely the Irish side. It's definitely both of them. Yeah, it's all. It's all of me. Yeah, but I think I think Koreans have uh, something called Han, and it's basically a chip on your shoulder, and. It's it's something spiritual in nature that Koreans know about, and then I think, 
you know, there's definitely the scrappy Irish side of me. So I think, you know, it's like there's stereotypes, but I think there is truth to those things. And when you're going out and you're in your 20s and, you know, <laughs> into your 30s That's and true. you're still you're, drinking yeah. and, right, yeah. and going out after after these shows, you know, somebody says something smart. It's like, well, I'll, I'll say something back. And then it escalates and then it kind of goes from there. So I never minded, like, you know, getting into a tussle when I was younger. It's the hockey thing. It was definitely the hockey. Did you pull anybody's too. shirts over their heads? Did you do <laughs> pull well, that move a couple times? When I was in, uh, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, with another comic. And if you guys, I, I don't need to tell it again if you heard it, but uh, you know. Oh, uh, is this the is the elevator? Yeah. Oh, can I, you please tell that story? Yeah. That's, so I, it's just one of the craziest fight stories I've ever heard. So I, I, I after the show, you're a young comic, you're single, you go out, you try to meet some girls after the show, you meet some girls, and I was with another comic, we met some girls, we go back to the hotel, we separate off, we ho- all hook up, and then end up uh, in the other comic's room, and I was like, all right, well, I'm going to, these girls are getting out of here, I'm going to walk them to the, to their, to their car. He's like, you're going to walk them to the car? I was like, yeah, it's the least I can do, right? So, so I go out to, to walk them in the car, and then uh, we're in the, <laughs> in the lobby, I see... This one guy holding open the doors and four of his friends behind him. And I'm like, oh, God, I hope the girls aren't in that elevator. And, of course, the girls are in the elevator. So it's, you know, it's five black guys, right? Okay. And it's pertinent to the story. Otherwise, okay. I just, I just, it's just five human beings. Right. But it's right. pertinent. So so I go under the guy's arm and I swoop under and I'm like, all right, I get it, guys. We're all out on the weekend having a good, good night. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we're cool, right? And he is absolutely ignoring me. Absolutely 100% ignore me. He's just laser focused on this girl. He's like, come on, come on, come on, party. She's like, I'm not partying with you. He's like, come on, give me your number, give me your number. She's like, I'm not giving you my number. And he keeps doing it. And I go, I go, come on, buddy, let's just wrap this up. And his buddies were like tapping him on the shoulder to wrap it up. Oh, even his buddies were. His buddies yeah. were. And I was like, thank God, that's a good sign. And then I'm thinking it's going to de-escalate at some point. And he's going to partition off. And he asked like two or three more times. And then the girl goes, I'm not giving you my number, you, and then she dropped the N-bomb, and I was like, oh. oh I was like God. Ralphie in A Christmas Story. Oh, <laughs> fuck. Right. So I'm just sitting there like, no, and everything in this moment happens in slow motion. I, I remember vividly, he comes into the elevator, and then because he's been holding it so long, it's not like pressure's built up, but the door's just shut. Right. Because they've been waiting to shut. And so you're in there with him and the two girls. I'm in there with the two girls, and he <laughs> starts kind of like walking towards the girl, and I get in front of him, and I, you know, I'm like, you're not touching the girl, so I get in front, hold him back, and now I know the minute I kind of go up, I'm like, it's do or die. We're in an elevator. This is bad. And again, playing hockey mm-hmm. when I was growing up, you know, you, you got to figure most black guys don't play ice hockey. <laughs> <laughs> So so I just go over and I pull the shirt over his head and I just start wailing. I'm going for broke because again, we're in an elevator and I know it's compact. I'm just like drill him, drill him, drill. Him. I'm just wailing everything I have on his head and he's going, chill dog, chill, chill dog. I go, Are you done? He goes, chill dog, chill. I go, Are you done? Are you done? And I keep wailing. He goes, I'm done, I'm done. So he stands up and he pulls the shirt off and it, it pull, he goes to pull the shirt on. And as he's pulling the shirt on, I'm realizing we rocked the elevator off its moorings somehow, so we are stuck. We're absolutely oh, so, yeah, so stuck in the elevator. We're not going anywhere. So you, you just gave this guy a beating, but now, now you're, I'm stuck, you're stuck in, in an elevator. And the yeah. two girls still there, right? Two girls. How, the one doing? girl's crying. Okay. The girl that dropped the N-bomb is crying. The other girl's like calming her down. <laughs> and I'm wondering, is this guy going to be a rat in a coffee can? Is he going right. to come after me right away? And he pulls the shirt over. And I remember... Sarah Smiles by Hall & Oates was playing. <laughs> so every time I hear that song... Oh, so you're triggered every time yeah, you hear Sarah? I'm at a CVS in here. Sarah Smiles! you put up your fist instantly. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Where? Who? I have PTSD <laughs> from that or something. And so, so I remember that song was playing, and now this guy is staring at me. And I, and I catch him in the corner of my eye, and I'm just kind of like trying to not look at him and ex, you know, accelerate the situation right, or whatever. Right. And then he keeps he keeps like looking at me, looking at me. I'm like, I, this guy's going to throw another punch at me, so I got to get ready. So I I, I kind of look back at him, and he's just staring at me. He's looking at me differently. And then he just he just says, he goes to me. He goes, "Were you on BET's Comic View?" I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "You did the Bruce Lee bit?" I go, "Yeah." He goes. I love that bit. I go, yeah, man. I'm a comic. He goes, what are you doing in town? I go, I'm doing a 
the Phoenix, uh, the the <laughs> improv at, at the Phoenix Improv. He's like, oh, that's awesome, man. I was like, yeah, I'll get you guys tickets. If you, that's how I met them. Oh my god! And uh, he goes, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so now we're kind of talking stand up, and then all of a sudden you're. Boo. So the elevator starts clicking in again, and I'm like, oh, thank God. So the elevator's <laughs> going, and the doors open, and his boys have been waiting in the lobby the whole time. So as soon as the doors open, pop, 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 I just get drilled. Ping, ping, ping. Oh, no. So his, My shirt gets his friends are all over you. Now it's a line brawl. Yeah, because they, they must have heard everything, <laughs> oh, okay. I guess, in the lobby. So it's a total line brawl. <laughs> and I, I just got pop, pop, and my shirt got ripped. And then he jumps in. He goes, no, no, no. He's cool. He's cool. Guys, he does the Bruce Lee bit on comic book. <laughs> oh and, like, and then they're like, oh! Because they had all seen it. And, and I was like, oh, thank God. So I step out. And then the hotel lobby guy goes, I called the cops. These guys split. The girls are gone. I'm in the elevator by myself. My shirt's ripped. I got a bloody lip. I got jacked in the eye. And the other comic comes out of the business center holding a coffee. He goes, what? happened <laughs> dude the bruce lee bit saved your life the bruce lee bit saved my life yeah <laughs> and he probably thinks i actually know martial arts but i have no oh, right. idea yes, what course. you know because yeah. back in the day you could just get in a fight and i think that's the difference like when you're growing up in the <laughs> in the 90s early 2000s there was no mma there was no you it was beginning you know right so right. you could literally be in a bar and some guy would just mouth off or you'd mouth off or i'd mouth off and then you just get in a fight and you just do the best you can everyone's based on the of, same level yeah yeah, yeah yeah but nowadays it's like i am not at all gonna get because you never know you never never know so no i'm not gonna i wonder if he uh ended up going to the gig he never ended up going to the gig okay because what uh, did he go to the door yeah i um i i got into a fight with steve yeah, Bird. he with said steve i could Bird. come by he's still think, telling that story <laughs> i think had that guy in the lobby not said i called the cops i would have yeah, gotten his right. name and stuff and gotten him oh tickets my god that is his boys. but yeah that that uh that was one of my that, that was the best fight story i've ever had so yeah but i've had many where i ended up on the that's like John Wick stuff, the elevator fight. The elevator, you know, yeah, you're, yeah, you're in an yeah. enclosed space. You know, that's well, just... it's funny because when I was writing the uh, the opening act, that was one of the scenes I'd written out because I wanted to take everything that actually happened to me on the road and incorporate it, but narratively, it wasn't doing anything for the story other than saying this happens on the road. You know, so it, it just um, it kind of fell by the wayside. But maybe maybe the next one. Well, uh, Steve Byrne, thank you very much for coming in, man. That's that's <laughs> yeah. an amazing story. It's, it's Well, I'm glad there's no stairs or elevator here. So Well, there is triggered. an elevator if you want to take a ride with Josh. Anybody got an issue with who me? Who knows how to hockey oh fight? Yeah. Let's do it! <laughs> Just clip on the fight strap on the back of your, back of your shirt yeah, you there. The fight strap yeah. Nowadays, yeah. But thank you for coming out. Uh, Steve Byrne, Laugh Boston. Tonight, one show. Uh, two shows tomorrow. LaughBoston.com. Uh, if you're on YouTube, and I know you are, uh, stop watching the cat videos and watch Always Amazing, uh, his yeah. uh, Amazing Jonathan documentary. And despite me not being in that one, it's still the better <laughs> of the two. Did you I see the to... newest one? Did you see the one on Hulu? Yeah. Did you watch it? Yeah. Well, well I'm in it. Of course, I had to watch my scene like over and over. What again. did you think of it objectively if you were to just comment on it? Because I do find it curious. Like if I didn't think. know who Jonathan was or yeah. if I didn't know there was another documentary? Yeah, what did you think of it? I I thought I I to be quite honest, I couldn't yeah. stop watching it. Yeah, and it's just because that whole like, is he really sick? Right, right. Kind of thing, and he does. You know, Jonathan, he's not like Andy Kaufman in that right. sense, but he is a prankster. And I don't yeah. know if that's something he would do, like, and just bringing on another documentary crew to kind of to to make the situation difficult. Yeah. If you know what I'm saying, I don't think Jonathan's that smart to pl game plan things like that because he would never know where these are going to end up. But I think knowing knowing that I was on the other side and I saw it. I saw it with my lawyer. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so sure. Yes. I watched it <laughs> and I was I was trying to be objective as well. Because if it's if it's like intriguing, I go, Oh, okay, I, I understand what's going on. But when you know all the plot points are mm -hmm. deceived and uh, made of deceit deceitful nature and contrived, uh I think that when I when I watch it, I could deconstruct it. I'm like, oh, it's all just it's all just false. It's all completely false. Well, you so, can tell that one is made for them, and yours is kind of made more for Jonathan. Who's, yeah, mine was a love letter to Jonathan's yeah. legacy, career, and the friendship that unorthodox fraternal friendship he had with Joel. Because I've known them for so long, and I've known all the stories. Mm -hmm. I knew exactly the story I wanted to tell. So I was never in a pinch to create something right. like like that that confrontational point where he sits down with jonathan and says um he says you know i think you're faking this i, I yeah. think you're making it all up right what he didn't put in the film that i know 
is that he pulled out like two grand and said, if you take this money and let let you let me film really? you throwing me out of the house, really, I will um, I will have an ending to my film. Wow. And Jonathan, that's when John, that's when Jonathan takes the mic off and he's like, all right, get out of here. I want you out of my home. So it's like I know all the tricks that occurred to to right. stoke that reaction out of Jonathan and. You know, when you know the other side of it, you're just like, it, it's all just BS, you know? Yeah. I wish I could swear on but it's... <laughs> so right, do we, so. believe yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Well, yours definitely captures the story between Jonathan and Joel, and I think that's that that's what makes your doc a lot better. It's because a guy's that story, film. It's, it's a great story between them. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a total guy's film. It's like yeah. two guys that truly love each other, and I, I, I'm really proud of it because when Jonathan said he was sick, and then he's coming back... Joel actually saw him through all those things, suicide attempt, nasty divorce, Vegas, the perils of Vegas, and then Joel ends up opening for him. I like That's why I did it in the first place, because I could see the whole film mapped out in front of me. So um, I know we ended this interview a little bit. No, ago, no, it's but. okay. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get, like, set things up over here, too. And so, but but um, you're going to play more killers in Oasis, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so well, I, you're, sta- you're staying to play the killer. I'm leaving. Okay, that's right. I'm that's right. Over. You're taking yeah. over for the next couple of hours. This is Steve Byrne. Guys, stay off the 95. It's jacked. Uh, WAAF. <laughs> Enjoy the weekend. All right, Steve Byrne, Laugh Boston tonight. Uh, two shows tomorrow. Uh, he promises he won't start a fight with you. And, yeah. uh, and check out Always Amazing, <laughs> the amazing Jonathan uh, documentary on YouTube. Thank you very much Thank for coming. So much, Appreciate, it. Appreciate it.